Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention, we'll begin our program, next phase of the program, uh, at least uh, uh, for today. Welcome to McConnell Center's 2022 Constitution Day lecture and series uh, of events. If you're joining us online, I appreciate your time tuning in uh, today. I uh, really appreciate all of you that come out on this beautiful Kentucky Day to actually be here uh, with us today. Really appreciate, appreciate all of you. Of course, we gather today to commemorate what, if I'm not a math guy, but if my math is right, the 235th anniversary of the members of the Constitutional Convention signing off on the final words of the Constitution and then sending it out to the states for consideration and ultimate uh, ratification. It is the oldest existing constitution in the world, but it can't last, it can't last over the long term from now without a solid knowledge and appreciation of its history, its principles, its intent, and its possibilities. For that, we rely on great teachers to educate and inspire the next generation of American citizens. And I'm proud to say that many of Kentucky's very best are with us today, either on, in person or are on, online watching, watching us here at the University of Louisville. We should appreciate their efforts to be involved in a program like this on a Saturday to keep improving their knowledge growing their experiences related to our founding documents and honing their craft for the future, uh, for our students and future citizens. Today we also pause and remember one of the best teachers in Kentucky that I've ever encountered, ever had the chance to work with. Carmen Thompson was taken from us far, far too soon, and more importantly was taken out of the classroom far too soon. The McConnell Center has only given one Henry Clay Cup in our history until today. The award is our highest civics award, and today we're going to give it posthumously to Carmen through her family that's here with us today. I want to ask Milana Salyer to come forward. Milana is a teacher in her own right, but she also was my, my right arm in creating our civics program, I don't know how many years ago, some, some, some years ago. And um, all of you, or most of you at least in the room, uh, as teachers have worked with Milana, um, have uh, gone on trips with Milana, and have appreciated, uh, appreciated her work. So, Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Milana Salyer. Well, it's an honor to be back um, here at the University of Louisville and with the McConnell Center today. So thank you, Gary, for inviting me back, um, not just to join in Constitution Day celebrations. I remember the very first Constitution Day celebration when they first became a mandate. Um, but to see so many good friends in the room, um, former colleagues, as always friends though, um, but most importantly to be able to meet um, Carmen's family um, and be able to have them here with us today. Uh, as Dr. Greg alluded to, in 2016 the McConnell Center awarded the first ever Henry Clay Cup for exemplary service in civic education. The recipient, we are lucky, is actually here in the room with us as well. I see him hiding back there. <laughs> so Glenn, we are glad to see you still here and continuing to champion um, the efforts of teachers and students in the classrooms as well. Um, but it is my honor today to award the Henry Clay Cup in absentia to Ms. Carmen Thompson. She's a Franklin County educator who spent her career dedicated to, her his to history, her students, and those she loved. Carmen, known by many of her students as Mama T and by her friends as Bubbles, impacted every life she touched. A German immigrant, Carmen valued America in a way few truly understand while remaining true to her heritage. She was passionate about United States history and brought that passion to the classroom. 
Her students participated in History Day annually, and she was always looking for opportunities to expand their traditional classroom experience. But her students weren't the only ones whose life she impacted. She was an educator of preteens and peers alike. Carmen participated in almost every professional development opportunity presented, bringing her knowledge and experience to every event. One of her former roommates from numerous professional development trips said, Carmen was a light in whatever situation you experienced with her. No one could say they felt sad or alone around her. She embraced you with light and joy. I always think of her smile and laugh. She was one of the warmest, kindest, and funniest people I've ever known. Everyone who spent time with Carmen has a story to tell. Friends recently shared a memory with me that encompasses Carmen so perfectly. While in Chicago on a trip, a player for the Chicago Cubs was holding a charity benefit at their hotel. It wasn't long before Carmen had managed to get herself and the group into the event, and she worked the room, talking and laughing with everyone as if she had been included in the event all along. I personally recall a state social studies conference that I was unable to attend because I was pregnant. Carmen and some of the others who are still in this room here arranged a virtual baby shower for me from the hotel bar. This was pre-COVID, so virtual events were not a thing. They sent me pictures of all the adorable baby girl essentials they had brought, and their love came through in every picture. Her love for social studies was matched by her love for her family, for her art, the UK women's basketball team, and her students. My son plays basketball for his middle school team, and they played Carmen's team last year. I didn't make the connection until I saw the name on their jerseys, and as soon as I did, I felt her presence, because I have no doubts that she would have been at that game, cheering on her students and my son, because that's who she was, a cheerleader, a friend, and a light in every situation. To quote another colleague, Carmen embraced life, teaching, learning, loving, giving, celebrating, friendship and family with her whole heart. It's my pleasure today to present the Henry Clay Cup to her sister Ronnie Sandusky and her son Stephen Thompson on her behalf. We are all so grateful for her contribution to civic education in Kentucky and for her friendship along the way. We miss you, Carmen. That's why I asked Milana to do that. Perfect, Milana. Thank you. Ronnie, Stephen, thank you for being here, for uh, representing uh, Carmen. Um, what an inspiring teacher. What a dear friend. Uh, I miss her. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Milana captured it right. What a, what a woman who loved America. Uh, she sure did. Um, it's my pleasure now to... Uh, to ask Megan Crowley to come forward and to introduce our speaker for today's Constitution Day lecture. Megan. Thank you all for being here, whether in person or on YouTube, to celebrate Constitution Day with the McConnell Center through the continuation of this year's public lecture series. Though Americans are more divided than ever, we may listen to each other less. We at the McConnell Center, however, still believe in the power of conversation, of speaking our minds, but also of listening to others. This is the vision behind the McConnell Center's new project, Variety, Left, and Right. Throughout the year, we will explore the foundations of political thinking, both left and right, on their own terms, seeking to understand rather than to conform. We will align ourselves with free speech and free inquiry to consider both our own positions and the good of our community with the help of a diverse team assembled from across the University of Louisville. This fall, we will walk through the history and foundational ideas behind conservatism and liberalism. In the spring, 
will turn our attention to the role of religion in our political thinking, and then to black political thought, feminism, and localism, so as to find ways to work together to achieve common goals. Today, though, we first delve deeper into our focus for August and September, how to have diverse, difficult, open, and productive conversations. To help with this task, we have with us Dr. John Rose from Duke University. John Rose is Associate Director of the Civil Discourse Project. In addition to helping coordinate the Civil Discourse Project's programming, Dr. Rose teaches courses in happiness and human flourishing, Christian ethics, political ideology, and political polarization. His research concerns the tradition of virtue ethics and Christian theology. Originally from Iowa, Dr. Ro Dr. Rose holds a BA in religion from Wabash College, an MTS from Duke Divinity School, and a PhD in theology from the Princeton Theological Seminary. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Rose. Wonderful. You can all hear me well? Okay. If not, go like this, louder, and I'll lean forward. Very good. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. I'm grateful for the invitation to speak here today. A special thanks to the organizers behind the scenes. I'm a little unusual in that here I am giving this public talk, but I have um, spent a lot of time, actually, as the person running logistics for events like this. And so having done both, I can tell you that standing up here and giving this talk is the easier of the two. It's actually I'm just showing up and talking, so thank you to the organizers. Um, following the title of my talk, um, um, first I'm going to discuss what is meant by polarization, uh, how it's manifest in educational spaces, and what better civil education might look like, one in which civic duties are upheld and we act like healthy citizens in a functioning democracy. My hope is that by the end of the remarks, I'll convince you all of our need to do our own small parts to bring about better civic education and leave you with a few tips about perhaps how to do that in educational spaces, whether you're a teacher or a student, whether you're in the high school space or the working at the college level. And I'm gonna leave time for question and answer. By the way, when Gary told me that there would be some high school teachers in the audience, I was delighted because I increasingly think that the work of civil discourse in the classroom must begin at the high school level. I teach freshmen through seniors at Duke, and my first semester freshmen come to me already showing the effects of negative polarization. That is, they aren't telling me, I'm, I don't know how to have a conversation about a hot topic, hot button topic, and, and they have anecdotes, this happened in my 12th grade class, and it was terrible. Okay, so it's, it, it needs to start earlier. Now let me get back to my talk. What do I mean by polarization? This is the nature of the problem. Polarization has a few features that I, I, I want to highlight. Uh, the first is that we increasingly see people of different political views not just as wrong, but as immoral. They're bad people, and they're stupid people. This is animosity towards the other side, or contempt. Uh, pollsters uh, now come up with what they call uh, thermometer ratings. Um, they ask people, like, how do you feel about people who you know, are the other political party? And we can look year to year and graph it, and wouldn't you know it, uh, these numbers continue uh, to get worse and worse. Um, never before have Americans <laughs> had such dislike for people of the other side. This is true of, of both parties. Um, you can see this, by the way, in um, um, people's uh, dating and marriage preferences as well. Um, if you ask this question you know, in the past, you, would you care if, if you fell in love with somebody of a different you know, political beliefs? Would that be a problem? And actually, it's true of parents, too. Would you mind if your son or daughter married a Republican or Democrat? And increasingly, parents are like, no, I don't want that. So different religion, fine. Different race, that's fine. Different politics? Uh-uh. That's where we're at, okay? Um, amazingly, um, our affection for our own parties hasn't increased over this period of time. So it's not like you like your own party more, you just dislike the other party. Um, 
um, even more. So it suggests that our strongest motivation in politics today uh, may be preventing the other side from having power. Um, and it suggests uh, a move away from issues and towards people or groups. It's evidence of tribalism. Now we're surely tribal creatures. To some degree that's unavoidable. Uh, it, some of you uh, perhaps uh, have pure hatred for the University of Kentucky. Wildcats and maybe some vice versa, right? Okay, uh, and that's fine, right? So the trick is, the trick is to be tribal in a way in which nobody actually gets hurt, uh, in which our democracy continues to function, and um, to be tribal up until the point in which you don't allow this tribalist mindset to hinder your ability to think impartially, when when that's important to do. Dislike of the other group is also personal. We know this. Uh, Alan Jacobs of Baylor has an interesting book um, called How to Think, um, from which I took, uh, helped myself to uh, entitling my course. I'll say a little bit about later. Um, but ba um, uh, um, Jacobs has this interesting phrase, uh, the repugnant cultural other. So this is the person out in society who is your uh, cultural opposite. You really dislike this person. And, and he says, basically, we all have one. Um, and and what, what, what's important about this, uh, on his view, is that this person sort of gives you an identity. You sort of know who, they, who you are, in part by your opposition. I'm not them, right? Um, so, so just, I'll close your eyes right now and think who that person, you have an idea, don't you? Okay, a cultural type, <laughs> I can't stand those people. Um, but uh, as I said, it's personal. Um, Jacobs gives an interesting example of uh, a person who um, saw his friends celebrate uh, the death of Margaret Thatcher on Twitter or whatever, right? And they said, ding dong, the witch is dead, right? And um, they were all celebrating. Um, this same person, um, when uh, Osama bin Laden died, sent out a tweet um, celebrating to his friends. And they chided him. What are you doing? That's tasteless. That's a human soul. He said, well, I don't understand. Is, is, are you saying Thatcher is worse than Osama bin Laden? Surely you don't think that, even though in his case his friends were quite liberal. Um, Jacobs' notion of the repugnant cultural other is helpful here. It helps make sense of, of why that, that group reacted that way. Bin Laden was sort of other, far apart, right? It's, it wasn't personal, right? The, the personal hatred matters more, even though you have to argue in the end these people shared more beliefs with Margaret Thatcher than they did with Osama bin Laden, right? But uh, she was their repugnant cultural other. Um, by the way, this tribalistic dimension of polarization sadly makes us uh, less smart versions of ourselves. Uh, you, may, you may think that being smarter or, or well-educated makes you less likely uh, to be susceptible to polarization affecting your ability to think well. It's actually just the opposite. We have experiments uh, on this very neat where they give you kind of fact patterns and they say, well, what does this say? And the, the, the data is made up, but you know, it's, it either shows that gun control works or doesn't work. And uh, the smarter you are, the more you can argue against it. And it subjectively says one or the other, right? It said, well, no, it doesn't really say that, right? So you've, you're, you're, you're rooting for your own team so much that you can't even uh, think logically. Um, there are other uh, features to polarization I, I, I want to note. Uh, one is that we're drifting apart uh, sides. There's more viewpoint purity on each side. Uh, it's getting harder to dis dissent. Uh, orthodoxies can't be questioned within your own tribe. And those who do question them get punished. Uh, the concept of the Overton window is helpful here. Uh, if you've never heard that, it actually it's it's developed by some economists. But really, it means kind of a range of acceptable opinions within your group. Right, what, what can you say it doesn't cause people to kind of look askew at you and say, ah, is, is, is he really one of us, right? And so you see the narrowing of the Overton window uh, in different subcultures in America. Uh, and finally, uh, polarization today shows itself in the sociological sorting along political lines or, or self-segregation. So your certain zip codes vote certain ways, other zip codes other ways, and we have more and more um, sort of landslide victory counties, and so counties in which just everybody votes for one candidate. It didn't used to be the case, right? People used to split their tickets when they voted. Um, counties were up for grabs. That's just not the case anymore. 
We had this strong rural-urban divide. Perhaps you have that in Kentucky as well, you know, between Louisville and some of these other states, uh, counties. Um, people shop at different grocery stores. You know, they, they eat at different restaurants. This is, uh, sociologists call this the uh, Cracker Barrel versus uh, Whole Foods test. Which one do you go to, right? You're all chuckling, because you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of become a, like a political or cultural marker. Like, I don't need to see the stickers on your car anymore. I can just see your car uh, sometimes, right? Or the way you dress, right? Or your eyeglasses, you know? Um, and I, and these, these are political tells. It didn't used to be the case it was that easy, right, in America to just look at somebody, you can size them up and say, definitely liberal, definitely conservative. Um, I'm actually really good at this. I don't know about you, Gary, um, but I'm doing it right now in this room. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But so, some of you do it, and I'm sure you're good at it, right? Um, but, it, but perhaps it shouldn't be that easy. Um, uh, hairstyles, too, by the way. I get going on that. Um, I don't... Um, there's, there's an interesting book written about this uh, by an author named Bill Bishop, um, and um, he actually traces the, the beginning of this trend towards sort of the, the self-segregation of like-minded America, people moving or leaving cities or wherever and just congregating with other people who think like them, have their own worldviews, to the 70s, not the 60s. You'd think it would be the 60s, right, with the kind of the sexual revolution and all that. It was actually the 70s when people had enough money to do it. Um, and then they this, this started, this trend, started this trend. What's important, I also want to point out, is that w what it means is that we're no longer interacting with people who think differently, right? We're not going to the same churches. Churches are very sorted now. Like Protestant denominations are just breaking up. Um, and we're not in the same neighborhoods. And so we're not, we're not interacting with other people. Uh, our kids aren't playing on the same baseball teams and so on and so forth. So we're, we can make caricatures of the other side. And we have the opportunity to fall out of practice uh, of, of civil discourse with people uh, who have different views. So this is, it's kind of a vicious loop. So we're in these bubbles, and then we become even more purified as a result of being in these bubbles, right? And, and, and we're even less likely to ever want to move to another place or frequent a different sort of store where we might encounter those other people. On and on it goes, okay? Uh, last, um, polarization is making everything political. Like football, for instance. Football didn't used to be political. It seems it is now. Um, things that we, we didn't think a, a political uh, uh, suddenly are. Now, I want to push back on this. Um, on what some of these things I'm describing are I'm calling negative aspects of polarization. Okay? I think they've gone too far. Um, one of the ways we can push back is to recognize that there are certain spheres of life that many of us don't want to be politicized, right? Or certain aspects of certain spheres of life, right? Uh, friendship, love, art, beauty, your vocations, right? Um, because we think um, that these spheres of life are not properly political or are or, or more important than politics or certain aspects of them, right? So you have a loved one um, um, who has different politics, all of us probably do. Um, does that mean you can't love that person? You can't be there for them? Um, I hope not, right? And why is that? Because there's something about that relationship that transcends politics, right? Um, it's also interesting when you, when you think about that person um, and, and you think, well, um, are these people really, uh, are people of the, of the other tribe really horrible and stupid? Um, and then you think about that one person you do know and you say, well, that's it's not really, that's overly simplistic, right? Like, I know this person, there's a story there, da 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 da. And then you gotta stop and remember that, that um, all those other people, of the other tribe, are somebody else's sisters, brothers, friends, right? And if you talk to that person, maybe you feel the same way about them. Easy to forget that. Um, polarization has, has, as I said, made things previously not political, political. And, it, and it's a form of political life that asks more and more of us. Uh, David Brooks, the former New York Times columnist, or still is he, uh, speaking at Duke a couple years ago, mentioned that politics today is like a drug. Uh, the more you give yourself to it, the more it asks of you, and the less it gives back. Until in the end, if you keep going, politics is asking everything of you and giving nothing back. I think some of us have seen this. Uh, maybe we're guilty of it ourselves. Uh, certainly evident on social media. 
So we become addicts. We're addicted to outrage and contempt that makes us sick, right? And one thing that gives me hope for the, the effort to depolarize is that it's precisely this. Um, I, I see these people who are so consumed by politics and hatred, and I ask them, how's that going for you, <laughs> right? You're miserable, I can, you are, you know you are, right? You don't want this, right? Um, so start there, that's a good place to start. One of the more, I would say, totalitarian aspects of some political discourse today is precisely its insistence that everything be political um, and be political all the time. Um, those of us who are religious, I'm religious, uh, must particularly push back against this. Uh, if we're spiritual creatures made for God, uh, we can't make everything political. We have to keep politics in its proper place. Uh, it can't satisfy our deepest longings. And our political identities, if you are religious, should never be more fundamental than our religious identities. I actually do this test with my students, like, what are the things that define you, right? And, and politics is, is very, very high, rather than, than say, place, right? Uh, like, where are you from, right? Um, whether it's a local place or just, I'm an American, right? Uh, and or your family, right? These are all these are all markers that were. If you give give that same test, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you'd get different answers, right? Like, well, I'm, I'm of this religion. I'm American. I'm a member of the Anderson family, right? Now politics is so high, right? Politics has become uh, kind of preeminent for a lot of people. Now, in response to this uh, negative polarization, I uh, decided, uh, in my little capacity at Duke. To, to do something about it. Um, I work in an educational setting, so naturally my response was to create a class. <laughs> and, uh, and my class um, is, is really just designed to help students uh, practice civil discourse, uh, to talk about hot, top, hot topic issues. And I, I don't shy away from the, ho the hardest ones. So whatever you're thinking right now, surely you can't talk about that, that's the one I talk about. Um, transgender athletes, pronouns, abortion, critical race theory, everything, right? And I, I asked my students in an incoming survey, what, what do you self-censor on, what, what can't you talk about? And then that's what we talk about. Um, and I'm gonna come back to that in a bit. Um, I'm of the view that um, um, because college campuses have such outsized cultural influence today, um, that this is precisely where we need to be looking, and, and in high schools too, um, if we're to do the work of, of bringing about better civil discourse. So to say what, what happens on campus no longer stays on campus, it's true. So, so I say let's run it in reverse. Educational spaces are feeding polarization. Let's get them to do the opposite. Now, my course is called How to Think in an Age of Political Polarization. It's, it's not called What to Think. Right? I, don't, I don't come in and tell my students, here's the right view on this issue. Um, when I do case studies, or stress tests as I call them, I give texts on both sides and my students can make up their own minds, I'm, I'm absolutely neutral. Um, like everybody else, in the wake of 2016, I saw that our, our country was, was coming apart, um, and I wanted to do something about it, so I started teaching this class at Duke in, in 2018. Uh, I'm not a political scientist, um, I'm, I'm actually a theologian. Um, and I didn't know if the seminar would work, it did, and, uh, and it's not because I'm, I'm some kind of special teacher, um, that should come as a relief to some of you if, if you're thinking, like, I, I'd like to try to do this in the classroom. Um, the class works because there's a great demand in students for uh, atmospheres or environments in which they can speak freely. Uh, I simply tapped into it. Um, now, I've already described what polarization looks like at the national level. Here's what it looks like on the campus level today, okay? Um, based on a 2021 uh, survey of students at 159 colleges, more than 80% of students report self-censoring their viewpoints. So the self-censoring meaning I, I can't say what I really think for fear of social, maybe even professional penalty, right? At least uh, um, uh, with 21% saying they censor themselves often. So the source here is, is an organization called FIRE. You can look it up if you want. 66% of students say it is acceptable to shout down a speaker to prevent them from speaking, and 23% say it is acceptable to use violence to stop a campus speech. Um, this, is, this is alarming, is it not? Uh, now, in my own experience with Duke students, um, I can say that they're actually hurting from political polarization. So um, I do little polls in my class, which is not a huge sample size, like 100, 
Um, and my students, uh, uh, two thirds, more than two thirds, tell me they self-censor. And it's not just conservatives. Um, <laughs> two thirds of my students are not conservatives. Um, and, and my students, I think, you know, resent this. That is, they wish it were otherwise, that they could speak more freely. Um, and students, I think, want greater uh, kind of viewpoint diversity in the classroom and in lectures. Um, now, I, I, I grant this, this sounds like at odds with what I, what I, what I just said. Um, wh which is it now? Um, they don't want speakers to speak, and yet um, they want more viewpoint diversity. I think that there is kind of a, a paradox right now uh, among kind of the younger generation. Maybe it's true of the older generation, too, uh, in which uh, we're kind of caught up in, in cancel culture. Uh, but we actually, at some level, want it to stop. Uh, I, I call my students, uh, there's this notion of a kind of voluntary spies in which you're, you're kind of ratting on each other, uh, telling, oh, she said this or that, and students are worried about cancellation. Perhaps that's true of the University of Louisville. Um, I joke my students are, my, are involuntary, voluntary spies, because I, I think that they actually kind of want all this to stop, right? And so that's what I'm tapping into. Um, I, I want to um, just mention uh, a few strategies I have for, for motivating my students. Some of you are, are teachers. You're going to try to promote civil discourse in your classroom. And maybe you're going to get some students who say, yeah, I don't see why, I, I, or I, I, maybe I, I don't even like the idea of having difficult conversations in the classroom. So um, here, here are some things that, that, that I do. Um, I try to appeal to my students' desire to repair uh, friendships and family problems caused by political polarization. I think, um, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands here, but I bet a lot of you uh, know either you personally or somebody else has had a friendship damaged by this, right? And it's sad, right? You, 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 don't, you don't want that. Uh, I've actually had two sets of friends uh, with mixed politics agree to take my class together because they wanted to mend their friendships. It's kind of funny. Um, more often than not, though, it's, it's students' parents with whom they can't see eye to eye politically. I guess, and that's that's very common, like on the University of Louisville campus, like a student, probably more liberal than his or her parents, and you go home on vac vacation, and it's tense, and, and you don't feel the love <laughs> like you like you both sides would want, and that's unfortunate, right? Um, so start there. If you say like we we can do better, we want to do better, or well, why? Well, don't don't we want better friendships and better families? Um, Make an argument to your students for the value of, of intellectual diversity. I mean, it's somewhat theoretical. Um, you can try it if you want. Um, but the, the, I mean, the argument is, is, is rather simple, right? You, you benefit from hearing the other side to see, you know, kind of find where there are weaknesses in your own arguments. Um, and, and, you know, you're not always right, of course, right? Um, um, my go-to example is, uh, is actually J.K. Rowling. Um, I tell my students, look, she, her views are very much welcome in, in this class. And then I add, you might also want to consider the possibility that her position is correct. Ah, you know. Um, part of what I'm doing, really, in my class is to try to expand the, the kind of Overton window in my students' minds. And I, and I think this is a good thing uh, for any educator to do. I, I, I sometimes try to motivate, motivate my students by uh, getting them to question whether or not they are really free, okay? Uh, whether their views are really their own. Uh, one thing I, I know about the, the younger generation, I'm not that much older than you, by the way, but I'm going to call you the younger generation, is that in my experience, they place a real premium on freedom uh, and autonomy and hate the idea of being conformist, right? Like, every, like my choices, everything's mine, right? I say, including your politics, your worldview, are you sure? Uh, if you're such individualist thinkers, I ask them, why do you all agree in your worldviews? Um, Abigail Schreier, in an article I assigned in my class, uh, tells uh, students at Princeton to, to, quote, take back your freedom. It's yours to demand. Uh, and I add, you must take it back yourselves. That was my message to the students here. Um, educators can give you the chance. Right? We, create the right ground rules and so forth, but you must take it back. Uh, and in taking it back, you will discover that you actually give it to each other. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, here, here are a few ways uh, that I found some success in teaching civil discourse. Uh, first, uh, I'm an Aristotelian, um, so I believe that you have to practice what you preach, and, and in practicing it, you actually teach it. Right? So it's um, good civil discourse, healthy 
uh, conversational habits that sustain our democracy um, are things you do and you practice, right? So it's not just a matter of, of it's not like learning math. It's more like a craft. And you, when you see people do it well, you imitate it, and then you learn to do it yourselves, right? Um, we all need to conduct ourselves better. Um, we might like a, a, the idea of a quick fix for our problems with polarization by adopting new legislation, but I don't think that'll ever be a, a cure-all. Uh, the fix needs to be more bottom-up. So if you're teaching civil discourse, be a good practitioner. Uh, students will sniff you out if you're a hypocrite. Um, if, if you don't believe what you're preaching in the way of the best practices for discourse, I wouldn't even bother doing it. Um, and if you're a student, don't assume that civic leadership must come from um, older people. Uh, they can't do it all for you. Uh, you're the ones actually canceling your peers most of the time, so remember that. Uh, if you're in an educational space and trying to practice civil discourse, uh, consider beginning by addressing the elephants in the room, often in kind of fear of cancellation, or questions about free speech. Create humility in the room and show it in your conversations with others. Um, you don't know everything, you're surely wrong about some things, all of us are. Saying this doesn't require you to give up your convictions. This, this, is, a, um, this is a myth out there that somehow humility and conviction are mutually exclusive. They're not. Um, Recognize that you're morally imperfect, too. Uh, I'm often amazed that my students, um, so most of them at least, if not all, seem to think that they, that they would have been abolitionists had they been born a white southerner in the antebellum south, and yet they never dissent among their peers today. It's the damnedest thing. Um, so um, figure that out. Um, do all things in charity. Uh, among other things, this means hearing each other's arguments in the best possible way, like what seems to you the, the most rational spin on something, rather than the worst, okay? When both sides find the other intolerable, see if you can't go deeper, figure out uh, where the, the, the real root of disagreement lies. Um, if you're a teacher, tr try this. Uh, this might work really well with high schoolers, too. Try appealing to your students' sense of toughness, right? Uh, Van Jones, the strategist of the Democratic Party, once wrote, to, once told students, uh, I don't want you to be safe ideologically. I don't want you to be safe emotionally. I want you to be strong. That's different. You're not going to take the weights out of the gym. That's the whole point of the gym. <laughs> That's a great metaphor, isn't it? Right? Uh, it, 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 it actually works even better when you remember that, uh, those of you who know kind of um, what it's like to train as an athlete, um, you're less likely to get physically injured in a sport if you have trained to improve your strength and flexibility, right? So I, I, I want you to be intellectual athletes, right? I want you to be stronger. So the goal of my classes is to get my students to see those who hold opposing opinions positions on political, religious, and cultural issues as fellow friends or potential friends, learners, and eventually co-workers from whom to learn rather than as foes to be ostracized or canceled. I try to help them see whether they're, uh, they're, whether they're in uh, uh, bubbles on the left or right, feedback loops, echo chambers. I recommend, if you're a teacher, um, to teach your students, teach yourself, we all work on this, myself included, to just to be consistent in your moral standards. Uh, ask yourself, is, for instance, if you're talking about the limits of free speech, is this a notion of acceptable speech that in different hands would yield a society that you don't want to live in? Is your notion of, of a harmful or offensive speech indexed to your particular politics? If so, are you sure you want to make coercive rules right now on the basis of these concepts just because you happen to be in charge for the moment? Uh, the example I give to my students sometimes is um, imagine um, the, f the faculty administrators uh, at s elite schools um, being um, uniformly uh, pro-life. I know this is hard to imagine, but just imagine it. This is what we have now is the opposite. Um, but, but, but imagine um, that in this hypothetical world, uh, they judged um, pro-choice speech, that is, you know, students, groups, or um, 
what have you, professors, um, to, be, to be dangerous because their, their speech could lead to, well, death, right, on their view. Um, and therefore, uh, they, they, they censor that speech. Oh, my students are horrified at the thought of this, right? Uh, I said, that's right, that's right. Um, we, we don't want to create rules uh, we don't. We don't want to create standards that really are are just for us, for because we're in control, right? It's not a society you want to live in, right? I tell my students to always assume goodwill on the part of of the fellow students or the authors we read. I think this is just good practice for any of us, just talking to people uh, in everyday situations. Um, Engage with them on the terms of their own self-understanding. So if they say, that's why I believe that, then, then take them at their word. It may not actually be true, right? But it does not help conversation to kind of posit kind of ulterior motives for views, right? So don't say, you believe, you say you believe X, but you really, uh, you say you believe that because of this, but you actually believe it for some other reason, right? And the other reason is always something like not good, right? Um, some kind of ism. And um, so, I mean, examples of this would say, you know, uh, you say you want to help the environment, but you really just hate humanity, right? Uh, or you say you want to help unborn babies, but you really just want to control women's bodies, right? Probably heard some of these things. Um, about, about this, I, I like to ask my students um, to keep this test in mind when discussing a subject. And I actually think this would just be good for all of us. Um, I, tr I try to think of this myself. Are you talking in such a way that it encourages deeper, more open, honest discussion in your speech, a, a more, more open, honest discussion, or is your speech doing the opposite? Does it chill the room? Think about your word choice, your tone, your body language. Sometimes I think we should work on civil discourse the way athletes watch game films of themselves afterwards, right? So Louisville's players are watching game film today, perhaps. Watching. I thought I did well on that play. I did not, because there it is in the film, right? There's no argument with that. So we could do that and look at ourselves and say, you know, I thought I wasn't like showing my contempt, but man, it's right there. Just look at my face, right? So we, we, can, we can all work on this. Prioritize getting to the truth over winning the argument. Um, so it, it means, for instance, try not to use language that suggests that we are engaging in violence when we're talking to people of different political views. Right, so we give, give the enemy ammunition, right? Hoisting them on their own petard. Look at what a petard is, it's not a good thing. Um, we assume violence when we use these metaphors. Um, I, I think we should try in the classroom to think about discussion as, as collaborative rather than competitive. Um, the rabbi Jonathan Sachs once said that um, there's a difference between a, a debate and a conversation. Right, a debate is, is, is an exchange in which one side wins and one side loses, and neither side goes away changed. But a conversation, you know what I'm about to say, is an exchange in which um, neither side wins or loses, but both people walk away d different people, right? So I try to have conversations in my classrooms. We don't use the D word, there's no debate, okay? Um, and, and when it's, when it's obvious, uh, when the opportunity presents itself to, to kind of own the other side, right, or humiliate them, this happens, uh, don't do it. Um, give them an out. Give them an out in a way that you're, you're not overlooking the fact that um, you've kind of exposed some inconsistency, but instead you've invited them um, to, to maybe um, be persuaded, right? And I, I have a friend who uses this phrase, uh, friend come up higher. It's a lovely phrase, right? So it's, it's, what's implied there is that there's some kind of correction going on. You disagree with them, right? Um, but you actually want them, you want their friendship. You actually want them on your side, right? You're made for better, join me here, right? Um, so converse in a way in which you keep alive the possibility of friendship. Humanize the other side. The philosopher Terence once wrote, I am human and therefore I consider nothing human as alien to me. Some translations have it, or, or outside of me. Um, whatever that person is, the, whatever that, what that person thinks that seems wild to you, you remember that they are actually human. And that if, if, if you knew enough, you would come to see how whatever is that, that, that trace of humanity in them that led them to this is actually something that's in you too. It is. It's just that they've reached a very different conclusion and had different experiences. 
appeal to principles that are nonpartisan, you know, free speech, academic freedom, which the McConnell Center is going to talk about uh, and, um, in the upcoming semester. Here are some virtues that I try to focus on uh, with my students. Curiosity, humility, decency, even handedness, charity. Civic education must cultivate these good virtues, in my view. Curiosity means a willingness to think in real time. Um, I tell my students, don't come to me with kind of prepackaged positions. It shows a lack of curiosity. Promoting curiosity also means students can't stop others from having positions on issues because of that person's identity. So ask yourself this, are you a curious person? You should be. Um, do you really want to better understand the views of people with whom you disagree? That's, you should ask yourself that question. Um, I think we all have work to do there, right? It's easy, it's lazy, uh, it's comfortable to, to just not want to know or make the effort, right? If you care about our democracy, you should. Great thing about the virtues is that they are contagious. Uh, I've seen um, students in my class offer a, a kind of courageous or dissenting view, and lo and behold, a few more join in. Uh, I sometimes get my students to clap for a dissenting view, not as a, an endorsement of the view itself, but for the act of having expressed it. Um, it sounds a little like an AA meeting. Hi, I'm Evan and I self-censor. Uh, come as you are, I say to them. I'm not trying to get you to move one way or another on an issue. Um, just don't lie to me or your classmates. But the virtue I keep coming back to during the semester is charity. Charity. It's the most important virtue. Sometimes you might say love, um, but pretty much the same thing. Uh, Aquinas, the, the famous theologian, observed charity is the form, the mover, the mother, and the root of all the virtues. It's lovely. Charity is, the, is, in my view, key to civic education. We cannot have a community without goodwill towards others in our community. It's what makes our community a community. We, are, we have something in common. We have shared goods. We will the good of the other. That's Aquinas' definition of charity. I tell my students, flat out, try to love your enemies. Uh, this can occasion smirks at the start of the semester. Um, and again, I define love for them in Aquinas' term. To love is to will the good of the other. That's not saying like you have warm feelings towards them, right, towards other people. By the way, those of you who are family, you know this is the case, right? Like love is a policy, right? And so uh, imagine how, how you might be able to extend something like that form of charity to your fellow Americans, even those people um, who, you know, uh, have different views, uh, who, who, who do things you don't like. It's obviously hard to, to will the good of the other. Some, sometimes my students say the best they can do is tolerate. Others say it's morally problematic to love people of certain political beliefs. Some say it's a sucker's game to turn the other cheek, the stakes being so high and the other side being so untrustworthy. Others say it's a wonderful ideal, but uh, finally unattainable. So I use Martin Luther King Jr. in my class to show students how to love their enemies and why they must do so. And that's, I'm gonna talk about that, and then, and then I'll, I'm going to be quiet, and we'll have question and answer, hopefully. Um, King's uh, sermon uh, on loving your enemies is, is uh, I recommend to you. It's, it's beautiful. Um, to love your enemies, King tells us, we must discover the element of good in our enemies. And every time you begin to hate a person and think of hating that person, realize that there's some good there, too. See, says King, that there is a mix of good and bad in you, too. We're split up and divided against ourselves, he, he says in this sermon. And I just find these words so remarkable every time I read them. Consider, consider that who he was when he said this. And there is something of a civil war going on within all of our lives. There is a recalcitrant south of the soul revolting against the north of our soul. And there is this continual struggle within the very structure of every individual human life. Amazing. Amazing, right? And, and, and if he can say that, given who he was, um, who are any of us to say that I'm pure, my side is pure, but you, you know, you're impure and your side is impure, and it's just that simple? No. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the, the Soviet dissident, once said that the line between good and evil runs through every individual human soul. My students, I think our society, is sometimes tempted into thinking that the line between good and evil runs between 
their party and the other party. That being on the right side of a social cause, on the right side of history, usually spelled with a capital H, makes them good. I challenge them to see themselves as morally conflicted, right? It's not that simple. King says we must love our enemies because hating in response to the wrong only intensifies the existence of hate and evil in the universe. I think this is empirically true. We should love our enemies, he says, because hate distorts the personality of the hater. You can't see right. Li literally, you can't see right. And finally, and this is the one I highlight to my students, um, and I want to highlight to you all today. King says that we should love our enemies because love has within it a redemptive power. It's a special power that no nothing else can do it uh, qu quite the way love does. Love is a power, th there's a power there that eventually transforms individuals. King said that to change someone, you must first love them. To change someone, you must first love them. Uh, but that's not all. Um, and they must know that you love them. They must know that you love them, right? To, ch to change someone, you must first love them. They must know. How do they know? Well, by the way, you treat them, right? If you want to change the minds of your friends, your coworkers, your students or your classmates, or your family, don't shame them or silence them. First, love them. King's right about this. On the last day of class, I finally tell my students that my class wasn't really about politics, truth be told, uh, and I wasn't trying to change their minds. The class was, was really about love. And that my real goal was to make them better people and to make them better citizens. Our problems with neg negative polarization in our, our society today are, in my view, at bottom, moral failures. Um, no technical fix will solve it. We need a change of hearts. So how have these tactics fared for me over the last uh, few years? I would say my students have flourished. Unlikely friendships have formed and friendships that were damaged have been mended. My students can, can have conversations about topics that they previously thought were impossible. To, to have uh, in a classroom setting. Best of all, once they kind of feel liberated in this way, once they get a taste of that freedom, they never want to go back <laughs> to the old atmosphere. Instead, they want to spread it. They reassure each other that they are not alone uh, in wanting this different atmosphere. They give each other hope and confidence that a different way is possible. And I hope you remember this from my talk. Better civil discourse is possible in educational settings. And in closing, before opening things up to Q&A, if, if there's still time, I, I don't have a watch here, so I don't know how long I've gone. Uh, I want to iterate kind of central points. Practicing and teaching better civil discourse is fundamental to depolarizing our country. Educational spaces have been ground zero for this problem, and ground zero for this problem, and must therefore be ground zero for the solution to the problem. But it isn't just educational spaces. We need to do better in our everyday exchanges with people. This isn't always easy, but if you want to preserve our democracy, if you want to keep the conversation going in this country, if you're worried about this country being completely pulled apart, if you want to break the cycles of contempt, then you have the responsibility to do better. The future of our democracy is undetermined, just as it's always been. Thank you for your time. If you, guys ha if you guys have questions, you can raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone. Hi, uh, thank you. That was awesome. I love the central theme of charity and love at the heart of discourse. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I think as teachers we try to instill into our students. So you'd mentioned the beginning this process in high school. So us at this table, we're middle school teachers, oh, wow. even further back. Okay. Um, so in addition to practicing modeling, um, allowing for deliberation instead of debate, those sort of things, um, what sort of skills do you believe are foundational and how do we go about that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A willingness to listen, first of all. I mean, I, I guess I didn't mention the word listening, but now your question prompted that in my mind. I, I should have said that. Um, I think we're very quick to immediately want to respond right, because it's a contest. And the thought is somebody's gonna win or lose and everybody's watching, right? And this is about my, my standing, social standing, right? 
and listening is almost kind of giving the other person the opportunity to be on the offensive, right? But I, but I, I think this is completely wrong, and I, and I think that if, if we care about civil discourse, we need to learn to become better listeners, not just like just being quiet, but like really listening, really hearing the person uh, on their own terms, right? Rather than immediately thinking, okay, here's how I'm gonna respond to that. Um, we were already doing that in our brains. We gotta, we gotta stop. So if you could get middle schoolers to do that, that would be great, because they do that with their parents at home, too. So, you know, they could use that skill at home. <laughs> I, I think I might have uh, gotten this uh, statement from uh, your uh, article, uh, Dr. Rose. Uh, true engagement, though, requires honesty. And sometimes, I don't want to hear that honesty from the other side. And, mm -hmm. it, and the older I get, the harder it gets. Mm -hmm. So do you have any tips? I would like to truly engage with the other side, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to get there. Yeah, and when, when you say you, you don't know, you, you want them to be totally honest, is it because um, there's some ugliness in there, in, from your perspective, some ugliness in their, their reasons? Yeah. So this is hard. Um, I, I mentioned these statistics about students self-censoring, and um, people have pushed back and said, well, maybe it's not all that bad that 60% or whatever the number is of students are self-censoring. Um, maybe they have some views that really are, shouldn't be expressed. Um, in the case of my students, um, having like, spent a lot of time with them and coffeed with them and read their papers, I, I, I know this is not true. Um, in your personal case, I don't know who you have in mind, um, maybe it is true. Maybe these people really do have just some really kind of contemptible views. Um, and and I, I don't know what to say in response to that other than um, perhaps this is a, I sense myself running low on time, so I didn't read this paragraph. But one, one strategy I have for people is to continue to engage in friendship with people um, that in, in spheres that are not political. So in, in cases, I don't know who this person is or these people are, but like continue friendship with them outside the context of politics. And the more and more you can familiarize yourself with them and see if you can find common ground, even normative common ground and values, then see if you can't start kind of creeping back to this conversation and see if they can then be more honest with you. Um, but you gotta build towards it. I don't, that, that's not a great answer, but it's, it's a hard question, yeah. Um, I, I, this came from the article as well, um, that it says, I insist that goodwill should always be assumed and that the opinions can be voiced provided that they are offered in a spirit of humility and charity. Mm -hmm. I think my question is, what about, outs do you find you've created a safe space mm -hmm. for them in the classroom, mm -hmm. but are you, have you done any research about outside the cl classroom? So if someone expresses an opinion that maybe is not a popular opinion that maybe someone in the class is going out and, and canceling them amongst yeah. outside the classroom. Yeah, I've, I've never had that issue. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of that. You know, um, my classes um, begin with these ground rules, but they're, they're not so much a, a legal contract as they are a moral pact. So I say to my students, like, these, this is the thing we're trying to do together. We're gonna try to build this community. Right, of, of honesty and of goodwill and of real conversation. Do you want to be part of it? Right? And so if they were to do that, it wouldn't be so much that like, they violated a policy on the syllabus, although they would have. It would be like they were, you know, they let down their, their peers, which is a really powerful thing. Peer pressure is really powerful, so if you can get it working for you, do it. Uh, so I think, I think that's one of the reasons why, yeah. I think they don't want to mess up the class for the next, the next semester's class, you know? I think they sense that this is important. What is your favorite assigned reading to assign to students to discuss political discourse? Like a book or an article or any of the above? Um, you know, as, as kind of like a primer, I mentioned uh, Alan Jacobs' book, How to Think. It's, it's pretty good, um, and it kind of reviews some of the literature on polarization as well, as offering a commentary on it. Um, and he's, he's, kind of, he's kind of a political centrist, uh, evangelical Christian, was at Wheaton College. So 
question. It's kind of a unique perspective on the matter. It might be a place to start. Yeah, it's a good book. Uh, How to Think by Alan Jenkins. Just had a question. Um, I missed the source. When you gave the numbers on the percentages, on yeah. uh, that was absolutely mind blowing. I think. Yeah. Something, what was the name of that source that you got that yeah, from? Uh, Fire. It's an acronym. Uh, Foundation for Individual Rights. And you know what? I'm not sure, but it's Fire. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Google Fire Universities polls. <laughs> One more question? Is there, is there oh, no, maybe not. Okay, you were coming back up. All right, well, well thank you so much. <laughs> I really, I'm flattered. Thank you so much. All right, well, that concludes our event for today. We hope you all join us again in October when we discuss the foundations of conservatism and in November when we discuss liberalism. Thank you.